Thanks for listening to the Art Tactic Podcast. I'm your host, Adam Green. When we think of art museums, we often imagine long-established institutions that have been part of their local art scenes for decades, if not longer. It's rare to see a new museum emerge, but one that's made a significant impact since its opening just a few years ago is ICA San Francisco. As the art scene in San Francisco continues to grow, it's fascinating to consider what it takes to launch a museum today. How would you structure it? What would be your priorities? In this week's episode, we're joined by Allison Gass, founding director of ICA San Francisco, to explore these questions. The museum has recently been making headlines with the announcement of its upcoming move to downtown San Francisco. Allie shares insights on that move, along with a host of other exciting developments at the museum. We hope you enjoy the conversation. Thanks so much for listening. Thanks so much for joining us. Adam, I'm so thrilled to be here with you. And thanks so much for talking about ICA San Francisco. It's a super exciting time for us right now. I know, it really is. You've been making headlines recently, and I'm really excited to talk about the museum's forthcoming move to downtown San Francisco. It's a big milestone. Given how young ICA San Francisco is, I know how challenging it can be to establish a new museum and really get it off the ground. For our listeners who may not be familiar with the institution, could you start just by sharing the origin story of ICA San Francisco? I mean, I think it is quite rare these days to see a new museum emerge in the art world. Totally. Yeah, it's a, it's a really special story um, and a very Bay Area story in some ways. And you're right. The ICA San Francisco, we often call it the quote unquote startup museum, which is a funny thing to think about. But you're right that we don't normally think of a, a museum as starting a new, right? We often think of museums or arts organizations as having been around for a really long time. And ICA San Francisco officially opened its doors to the public um, October 1st of 2022. So we've actually just had, or is it, is it October 1st? Is that right? Today? Um, it is. So we are actually... You and I are speaking on our two-year anniversary. Well, happy um, two-year anniversary. Uh, thank you so much. It's exciting. Um, yeah, uh, we officially have been in existence for three years, but we've been open to the public for two years. So let me tell you a little bit about how this whole adventure came to be. So ICA San Francisco, as you know, is a contemporary arts institution, art museum. It's a non-collecting museum, which of course means we don't have a collection. We do rotating exhibitions and public programs. We often commission artists to make new work. So deep in the middle of the pandemic in 2020 to 2021, a handful of sort of wonderful art supporters and arts philanthropists and artists and gallerists in the Bay Area and I were kind of kicking around all sorts of thinking about what make great contemporary art cities in general and and specifically in the United States and talk about the reality that great art cities have all different kinds of arts institutions, right? They have great major collecting institutions often dedicated to, let's say, modern and contemporary art. Like in San Francisco, we have SFMOMA or more historic museums. Like we have the fine arts museums or they have smaller or they have great university art museums. You have the Cantor and Bampa. Um, they have smaller, more locally focused nonprofits. We have great spaces like that here in the Bay Area as well, like Root Division and many others, Southern Exposure. Um, and they often, these cities, have um, ambitious non-collecting museums, which in Europe are sometimes called Kunsthallas, and in the United States are often called Institutes of Contemporary Art or ICAs, and the kind of mothership of ICAs of maybe the ICA Boston, um, which started as a, I'm from Boston and started as kind of a small scrappy um, museum in a firehouse and has now of course grown to be this extraordinary architectural, beautiful institution down on the seaport um, in Boston. And there's other ICAs, they're not officially connected, but there's ICA LA, ICA Miami. Um, and people sort of thought, you know, what would it take to think about adding to the arts ecosystem in the Bay Area and create an ICA, which would be a space that would bring really significant kind of 
ambitious voices to the Bay Area, a space that because we don't have a collection would really specifically be a place to allow artists to take risks and push their practice in interesting ways, put that in context with the work that is happening here in the Bay Area. So we also do work with artists from the Bay Area and kind of see kind of how this sort of global or national zeitgeist is happening. Um, so we got together and thought about what would that look like, raised a fair amount of money in a very kind of like Bay Area startup kind of way, took this approach to say, hey, we're going to build this plane as we're flying it. We had um, the kind of great privilege to be starting from scratch. And this was in the middle of the pandemic, um, a moment when a lot of kind of inequities and challenges for arts institutions had really been laid bare and we said, you know, if we're going to have this privilege to start from scratch, we're going to sort of put some values really front and center. Things like being very committed to thinking about expanding the canon for the future of who gets to show in American museums. Things that a lot of museums are, are thinking about right now, but also thinking about, you know, some insider baseball stuff with museums like paying living wages and making salary equity front and center. And then I think one of the really critical facets of the ICA was committing to being free. So no barriers to access. So thinking about really making it accessible to all audiences. So those were some of like the really core tenets that um, we launched the ICA with. And um, we raised a fair amount of money pretty quickly. We were able to secure the lease on an amazing um warehouse space in the dog patch neighborhood of san francisco we opened on october 20 on october 1st 2022 with an extraordinary exhibition by the artist jeffrey gibson who of course went on to represent the united states this year at the venice biennale and and jeffrey i think really helped me and others think about like what an ica is there for he did a really ambitious unusual project that i'm happy to tell you more about but i'm going to stop talking that's the origin story of the ica <laughs> So as we discussed, it's quite rare for a museum to launch in the art world. So you had a unique opportunity, I imagine, to draw from both your personal experiences as well as observations of other established institutions to really evaluate what's worked well. And I imagine that must have really shaped how you wanted to structure the museum and really define its mission. And so you mentioned the museum's current location, but recently ICA San Francisco has made headlines for its upcoming move to downtown San Francisco. How did this move come about? And for our listeners who may not be as familiar with the city, what is the significance of being located downtown? So we love our home in Dogpatch. It's a really cool warehouse space. It was also sort of financially not tenable for us to stay in that Space, just given the cost and the sort of uh, 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 percentage of our operating budget it was taking to be there. Um, Dogpatch is an awesome neighborhood, but there's a lot of activity also happening downtown in San Francisco in terms of um, helping to bring the city back post-COVID um, and a lot of commitment from uh, major business owners and the city in terms of thinking about revitalization of downtown San Francisco. So to give you a sense of what's going on downtown, um, not unique to San Francisco, but many other cities as well, right? There's 30 million square feet of unrented retail space, storefront space in downtown San Francisco. Only a million of it was rented last year. So there's a lot of incentive to try to um, think about how to how to help people really return to downtown and continue to make it vibrant. And it's a pretty exciting moment. Um, we know from the history of the world that arts organizations have the ability to create major, major economic impact and bring joy and bring audiences and things like that. So as ICA was thinking about what the right continuation of building financial sustainability is, I've told you that you know, we, we had a real build the plane as we're flying it. We were committing to committed to being free, committed to salary equity, all those things. And we have a film. Our model is philanthropy, right? Incredibly generous donors who support the ICA. We're always thinking because we're really a startup, like what does sustainability look like for us? And thinking about um, what the right home is for us is an important key component. Of so. We started kind of exploring options might be for us. And in some of those conversations, we had a conversation with Vornado Realty Trust, that is the 
um, owner and operator of this pretty spectacular, iconic building at the corner, at a significant corner in the financial district in downtown San Francisco. Um, this building that was the flagship Bank of America building um, that had undergone a major renovation, but has been without a tenant for some time and is operated, um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an extraordinary building. It's also operated by a company called Skylight that does sort of cultural activations in terms of like event rentals and things like that. But the two ground, the ground floor and the floor below are perfect for an arts organization. So Vernado Realty Trust has been extraordinary. They have a history of believing in cultural activations as the ability to, as, as sort of able to create civic impact. Um, and in conversations with us, we've forged an extraordinary partnership where they have, um, where the ICA will now be moving to activate the key, the historic cube at 345 Montgomery Street. It happened extremely quickly and we were really lucky that the exhibitions we had planned for the fall um, were such that, um, we had we often do like really big site specific commissions and allow artists to really like kind of take risks and push their practice as i mentioned this was actually a moment where we were where we were allowing a curator to kind of expand a practice um and this is a group show guest curated by larry ose mensa with like really fantastic loans so when this opportunity came up i called larry ose mensa and i was like idea crazy idea what if we open your show instead in this iconic cube? Um, so we've taken this opportunity to partner with Vornado, activate the cube and move the ICA downtown. And, and um, I think it's really exciting. We're taking this very light touch approach, meaning I call it the kind of Venice Biennale style approach to um, exhibition models, where we're really allowing this building, which is pretty extraordinary architecturally, to kind of be the backdrop against which artists will really be able to experiment and install in this sort of not white cube kind of a way. Um, but it's really this like next step for possibilities of uh, kind of you know, interesting activation. We're super excited um, to be part of this kind of expanded presence in the Bay Area, close to other significant museums and galleries and um, accessible in different ways to, to sort of visitors, I think, and looking forward to lots and lots of partnerships as we think about what um, a cultural organization can do in terms of partnering with a real estate um, firm, certainly, but also, you know, other or, uh, other organizations and other businesses to think about, like, how we all come together to, like, continue to lift up our city. Well, I think it's just really impressive what you've built especially in bringing together so many members of the San Francisco art community and bringing on new ones to create this museum. And really over the past several years, it feels like we've heard a lot about galleries, art fairs, auction houses, and others really trying to tap into San Francisco and more specifically Silicon Valley's tech wealth to convert this audience into art collectors. But what hasn't been discussed as much is how to engage this group from a philanthropic perspective in the arts. So as you were starting ICA San Francisco, what was it like to engage the tech industry to support a nonprofit, quote unquote, startup art museum? And do you think there are any misconceptions about this community when it comes to the art world? It's a great question. And, you know, the ICA has definitely gotten a lot of press, um, whether deserved or not around being able to engage the quote unquote tech community, Silicon Valley community. It's certainly real that most many of our supporters, founding donors, members of our board are people from the tech community. And I think my experience of course, is that there's no monolithic, you know, tech collector, tech supporter. These of course are individual humans, um, some of whom are like deeply interested in the arts. I do think that it's very real that many um, of the supporters of ICA San Francisco come from the tech community in part because there's something exciting about this sort of fast moving 
build this arts institution, we've really founded with this, hey, we're open to trying to do things differently. We're If we do it wrong, we're going to be comfortable taking a left turn and doing it a new way, which I think you see us moving two years after opening because this is a more sustainable model for us. And we think it may be a really interesting opportunity for artists and visitors. That's a very like startup-y pivot, right? Um, and, it's, and it's something that I think certainly is appealing to people who built their careers in the tech community. So we have a lot of VCs, a lot of founders and entrepreneurs who support us. And what I have found is that of course, people from the tech community are interested in supporting the arts. And I think if you look around, you see them, those, these people also supporting other arts organizations um, in the city as well. Uh, they, they sit on the board of ICA San Francisco. They sit on other boards as well. So I think that's real. Um, I do hear a lot about how tech doesn't support the arts. Um, and I would just continue to say that Again, there's not a single monolithic tech person, um, but people are interested in ideas and very committed to think, figuring out how to lift up the city of San Francisco, in my experience. Um, and I also want to say that, you know, it, for, in many of these cases, these are often people who have like built wealth more recently. And to be philanthropic, you have to kind of figure out your wealth to be able and be stable to be able to start giving wealth a way to have this extraordinary capacity to be able to like support the arts or support other causes. Um, and so you kind of like take a little time to get people like to understand the power of supporting specifically the arts. Obviously that's what I understand the best. Um, and so it's also about like talking to people about like, why does it matter? Like why does a free museum that is committed to bringing like interesting artistic voices that help us navigate the world around us like why is that important so why might you want to support that right if you have the like great fortune to be able to support that so i, I definitely see tech supporting the arts in a like really deep and important way in the bay area so you mentioned that ICA San Francisco is a non-collecting institution. Of course, some museums have permanent collections, while others, like ICA San Francisco, do not. What was your thought process when deciding to structure the museum this way? Do you feel that there are certain advantages to being a non-collecting institution? Totally. And like ICA San Francisco really is in many ways the first job largely that I ever really had that isn't a collecting museum. Um you know, I was at SFMOMA and the Cantor Art Center and the head of the Smart Museum of Art at the University of Chicago. So collecting is something that I like deeply believe in and understand why it's so important. Um, and there's a lot of work to be done in all of these museums to like think about like the power of collecting and how you sustain a collection. Um, for me, it does feel also very important what a non-collecting art museum can do in the sense that you know, I talk a lot about ICA San Francisco as a place where we show contemporary art that responds to the events of the world around us, right? That provide audiences with a deep sense of like relevance about what's happening in the world. Other museums, of course, I'm not saying collecting museums don't do that. They do that too really well. Um, but what's what's fun about non-collecting is that you can kind of look around every time and be like, who's the right artist to turn to to help tell this story, right? Or who, you don't ever kind of look into your basement to tell a story. You're always looking out. The other thing about non-collecting is that you necessarily can be more nimble. Obviously, from a budget perspective, you can be more nimble, but you can kind of move faster and turn to an artist and be like, hey, we're ostensibly not connected to the market. So potentially this is this opportunity to make something that is not coming into our collection necessarily. You can make something crazy that wouldn't necessarily fit within your gallery system that I don't see ICA as the place where you're going to do your your mid-career retrospective because we don't have a collection. We're not negotiating loans. This is your chance to make this 
crazy thing that's been in your back pocket for a while. In fact, that's what I say when I go to studio visits. I'm like, what's in your back pocket that if you had a little time and a little funding, you would do. Um, and I often think about like what artists do at the ICA, you know, when they have their go on to have their mid-career retrospective at a major collecting institution. Like I want that institution and the artists to have to like contend with this crazy, awesome thing that they did at the ICA that kind of pushed them to the next level. Um, so non-collecting kind of gives a chance for those kinds of projects and and to move perhaps a bit more quickly. Um, I care a lot about collecting though, of course, because I think the, I think about us as being part of kind of cementing the canon of the future, so to speak. Um, I think one of the ways, of course, as you understand that, you know, artists gain criticality in the world is through being added to collections, whether private collections, frankly, of significant voices who will gift to museums and support museum shows or public collections so that people have like deep access to that work. So, you know, I, I do talk a lot with collectors and, and other institutions. And, and I do hope that the work that we show at ICA will go on and go into collections in the Bay Area or elsewhere as well. The city of San Francisco is home to major institutions like SF MoMA and the De Young Museum. Of course, every art community has its own unique dynamics. So I'm curious, do you find the San Francisco art scene to be more competitive or collaborative? And how has it been establishing a new museum in a city that already has a few long-established, highly regarded institutions? I think that, and I say this all the time, I think San Francisco is extremely special in terms of the collaborative nature. Um, you know, I've left San Francisco twice in my career and come back pretty quickly both times. Um, it really is uh, my professional and personal home. And it's because there is this kind of fluidity of social life and professional life amongst um, my colleagues in the arts and amongst the philanthropists and supporters of the arts here. I mentioned this to you, but it's very real. Like the people who sit on the ICA board sit on the boards of many other arts organizations, the Cantor, the De Young, the SF MoMA. Um, and I spend a lot of time, as I think my colleagues do as well, being like, oh, you should support that. You should support that. We talk to each other um, all the time and, and I think try to collaborate and help each other as much as we can. That feels really important to me, certainly having added a new institution, which I understand like necessarily made people feel trepidatious, um, perhaps. I definitely worked hard to expand and I see the ICA playing a really significant role in terms of potentially expanding the base of people who can and will feel like they should support the arts in San Francisco. ICA, as I think we talked about a little bit, has had a lot of success bringing in kind of first time supporters of arts organizations. I think there is an element of the kind of startup mentality there probably our, our kind of quote unquote price point is a bit more accessible if you're kind of first time supporter. And I really hope that many of these people will go on and support other institutions, larger institutions, things like that. Um, so I'm, I'm very keenly aware of that and take that kind of role pretty seriously as like kind of a, a place to, to enter and go on and learn about why it's so important to support the arts in your city, it's something you believe in. Absolutely. So tell us what's coming up at the museum. I don't know what's public, uh, but if you have any news to break, feel free. We won't stop you. <laughs> but it'd be great if you could give us a sneak peek at the upcoming exhibitions you have planned for ICA San Francisco. Totally. Um, I'm super excited about the exhibitions that we are opening with. Um, we are opening with, as I mentioned, this like our kind of large show exhibition is curated by Larry Ose Mensa, who is a fantastic kind of global curator. This is an expansion of this sort of seed of a project that he did last year at Art Basel Miami called Poetics of Dimension. Um, and it is an exhibition that is about uh, artistic identities that have been pushed to the periphery in the art world with artists that are exploring these topics through 
objects that have been made with non-traditional materials. He did it with four artists in Miami. And when he and I, he and I have been talking about him doing something at ICA for a while. And then he had this idea that this was such a kind of rich topic that he could push it to a much larger exhibition. So it's now, I believe it's 13 artists and um, it's just sort of extraordinary artists and extraordinary objects. So we have um, a big Nari Ward shoelace piece, two fantastic works by Anthony Akinbola, and Melissa Joseph, this like fantastic two works by Mofat Takadiwa, who for me was like a big giant standout um, in the Zimbabwe Pavilion in Venice. And I don't know if you know this, you probably know this work, um, sort of like incredible work made of like toothbrushes and toothpaste tubes and keyboard keys that look like com all the work in the show is like completely transformed or alchemized from what these materials are to something completely different. So I love opening with this show because as I said, we're kind of using the space as this found architectural space. And this is a body of work of found kind of materials. So I love it. That show's great. Um, and then we are as planned opening with this kind of beautiful little project show of the Bay Area ceramicist, um, Mariam Youssef, um, who is making it all new work. And this will be her first real institutional project, which I love. And then we added a show, this news just broke, so I can't break it for you, but maybe people don't know. So here you go. <laughs> um, um, we added a show because we have this fantastic space um, at the kind of front of the new ICA space that borders on California Street with this wall of windows. And we needed, as we kind of walked in there, we, my um, amazing assistant curator, Megan Smith, and I were like, we need like really extraordinary, like vibrant sculptural practice. And so we added a fantastic exhibition, a spotlight project of the artist Kathleen Ryan. Um, who, uh, as I'm certain you know, makes kind of large scale sculptures of rotting fruit out of like gemstones and shells and they're spectacular. And I'm very grateful to LA Mocha because they agreed to lend us this massive work from their collection called Screwdriver that, um, and this is just like, you know, talk about nimble. We're nimble, we move fast, as you and I both know, like large collecting institutions often are not. And we, you know, brand new space, don't have a facility report. We cobbled one together and in great partnership, we have this beautiful loan and then two local loans of a of rotting lemon and a rotting half lemon that we're really grateful for. So I think that'll be a really excellent addition um, to the space. So those are the three shows that we are opening with. Amazing. Yeah, all of those sound great and can't wait to check out the new space. Allie, thanks so much again for coming onto the podcast and sharing some stories about the origins of ICA San Francisco as well as the upcoming move and just your insights on the San Francisco area. If our listeners want to follow the programming and everything you have going on at the museum, where can we do that? Um, they should absolutely sign up for our newsletter which you can do at www.icasf.org or they should follow us on Instagram and we are ICA San Francisco on Instagram. Perfect. Thanks so much again, Allie. Really enjoyed catching up. Thank you so much, Adam. This was really fun.